Welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I almost said it wrong, but I got it right. <laughs> you did. I, I'm Jason Rugg, filling in for Josh Lindsay. Uh, and joining me is our documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey there, Jason. Thanks so much for uh, putting on the big boy pants and being our head co-host. <laughs> well, someone had to do it. Um, and then I'm also the trusty, dusty, uh, button-pushing guy, research extraordinaire, Jason Rugg. I'm also here playing two roles today. Um, and then we also have joining us a, a guest host, uh, cinematographer, Mindy Cook. Hi, so happy to be here with you all. Mindy, we're glad to have you. Can't wait to get into our discussion today on cinematography and whatnot. Yeah, me too. But uh, first, I think you have some updates for us, don't you, Christian? <laughs> I do have some updates, but before we get to that, yeah, Jason, Jason's giggling because Mindy just saved him. Because yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> To jump I'm also in trying and... to take notes. That's why I was ready to start. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. That's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, Mindy. Um, I do want to take a moment for a little bit of serious news. Uh, mm -hmm. Josh Lindsay is not here today because his father did pass away early this morning and our hearts are with him. I just want to take a quick moment of silence to think about Josh and his family, uh, what they're going through right now. And just um, in my mind, I'm going to pray that uh, they will feel the presence of Christ. So let's just take a moment of silence for that. Silence is sweet. Oh, that's awesome. All right, Josh, we're thinking about you, man. All right. Updates. I do have some. So we've got a lot of exciting things happening uh, since I uh, spoke to you guys last. First of all, I found out that we were the winner of the Lake Michigan Film Fest documentary category. So woohoo! Uh, this was a film festival that we entered in um, 2020 and it was pushed to 2021 and then um, it didn't happen until 2022. And so they combined it in 2021 and 2022 and just had it, I think in January or early February. And, you know, we did win the documentary category and they are wanting to bring us in for a screening at some other point. So uh, we were very excited about that. That is in the Le um, East Lansing, Michigan area. Uh, and I was very happy because Bob Devinney, one of our veterans lives in that area. So I do hope that screening happens so that Bob can join us. Uh, we also got news this week that we were accepted into the Sarasota Film Festival. I'm super happy about this. It's a 24-year-old festival. Uh, the bummer news is that only the feature films are going to be in person and the other ones are going to be virtual. So it is coming up, but uh, our short Grueling Glory will be um, be virtual. So we'll share all that news on social media and you'll be able to watch the grueling glory through that film festival. Uh, then we got more exciting news. Grueling glory was accepted into the Julian Dubuque film festival. And if that name sounds familiar to you, you'll remember that this time last year, we were accepted into that film festival for uh, the girl of war freedom. And that um, we did win best documentary category at that film festival last year. And we met a whole bunch of friends that was a film festival that was really the first one where a big group of filmmakers showed up for that festival. And it was just incredibly amazing. I'm still friends with a lot of those people to this day. That was a great experience. One thing I want to say about that is uh, it did remind me that now that I've got one film under my belt, uh, David Patterson talked to me about offering myself as a panel uh, person to sit on panels at different film festivals. And he encouraged me to make up a panel pitch document of different subjects that I could um, to speak about at a film festival. So I did compile that. I sent that off to the Julian Dubuque Film Festival and you know, maybe they'll put me on a panel. That would be fun. I would love that. They should. Couple. I'm going to put in a word, folks, Thank get you. Christian for your panels. She's yeah. an excellent panelist. And also I'm going to promo you a little bit here with the girl who wore freedom and say, ladies and gentlemen, everyone out there, you can bring the girl who wore freedom to a theater in your hometown and get Christian Taylor as either a speaker or a panelist. Um, email her Christian at documentaryfirst.com to uh, get details on that. But that's an offering that's also available. Absolutely. So for any of your event needs, bring Christian in her film. She's great. 
Mindy, you rock. You're on the show permanently now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how to push buttons and be trusty and dusty? Because you can take my <laughs> job. <laughs> Working on the dusty part, but uh... <laughs> definitely trusty. Um, thank you, Mindy. I appreciate that. Yeah, we are hoping to build out that part of our business. I do have uh, theater rights, so I can go anywhere in the world, take the film, do a talk, um, sometimes bring veterans, sometimes bring Danny. So that really is an option. Um, I'm and anticipating doing that kind of thing for quite a while because I, I love it. It's sort of my passion. I used to teach school. I love history. And so it's it's my jam. So thank you, Mindy. Um, other exciting news this week, we got um, great news that Air France will onboard us. I had a meeting with them on Friday. And so I then talked with Factory Film Studio and we're starting to get all the elements delivered so that by May 1st, the Girl Who Wore Freedom will be flying high with Air France. So that's really wonderful because Danny and Flo are going to be flying to the United States in May on Air France. And how amazing is that going to be? that Danny can watch her film on the plane. So I'm excited about that. Our schedule is coming into clarity for May and June, as it looks like right now, Airbus uh, in Washington, DC is gonna have us in for an event around the middle of May. Uh, then from there, we go to Manhattan for, the, um, for an event with the Alliance Francaise and Delta in downtown Manhattan. That's open to the public and you'll hear more about that on our social media. Then after the Alliance Francaise event, I think we have another event in Atlanta with Delta Corporate Headquarters, something about a conference there. And then on August 31st, we have a World War II veteran Delta Michelin Best Defense Foundation dinner uh, in Atlanta. And then on June 2nd, we fly to Normandy for a D-Day whirlwind of the next 10 or 15 days. So uh, we're super excited about that. I think one of the things that makes my heart really happy, Bob and Janie Miller are going to be coming along with us. They are our biggest, um, you know, I, I really, they are the backbone of this project. Uh, they have been consistently um, giving and supporting us in not only financially, but also in wisdom, advice. They actually come and help us at our events. And so this really is a, a, a wonderful opportunity for them to come and be part of our team, see the film in Normandy. They're also, they've booked Flo and Jenny, uh, Flo Plana and his wife, Jenny, for about a week or two, I think, of tour guiding. Uh, so they just decided they wanted the caviar experience. So uh, we're really happy about that. And um, yeah, so those are my updates uh, as of right now. That's awesome. It's some really exciting things coming up. Yeah. So I think you maybe had a Patreon update for us too. Is that right? Yeah. You know, actually, uh, I would like you to give the Patreon update because you're I sort of our, the man on the street with Patreon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was funny. You introduced me as cinematographer. I would probably say aspiring cinematographer. That's, that's a skill I am working on. So as I work on that skill, um, I, my day job is in marketing and I am assisting Christian with our Patreon community here. So we are up to 14 active patrons for whom we are very, very grateful, um, which is equaling $372 a month for us right now, um, which Christian, that's putting us really close to our initial goal of $400 a month. Oh, no. oh. Um, so I'm really hoping for that, you know, next patron who's going to kind of push us over that goal line. Um, I will be celebrating that initial goal being met, um, even though our baseline expenses have grown and are, are a little beyond that at this point. Um, but if you want to come be the person who puts us over the $400 mark, uh, Christian, and I will both be very excited yeah, about that. Yeah, we will celebrate you for sure. Yeah. Um, but some of our Patreon supporters need a shout out. Do you want to do that now? Yes, I totally okay. do. I'm so excited about this. So the first one I want to uh, talk about is Joanne Trotman. So Joanne and I met in Beaufort, South Carolina. She and her husband were there for the screening of The Girl Who Wore Freedom about a year ago. And uh, I'm so excited because Joanne is really passionate about uh, a film on PTSD. Mm -hmm. And she and I began talking about this at that festival. And she came along board. She She's our biggest Patreon supporter, uh, and she, uh, part of that 
um, amount is me coming on as a co-producer. Also the trip to Normandy, they're not able to go this summer, but maybe next summer they will come with us. But Joanne, we are incredibly thankful for you. Uh, just so blessed that you've been with us now for about a year. So thank you. Uh, Peter Flood, Peter Flood and I met in 2018. Uh, he was working on some software that we were going to try to use in Normandy when we were first shooting. I'm so thankful for him. Um, haven't seen him in quite a long time, but Peter, thank you for, for listening to documentary first and to supporting us on Patreon. Benjamin Smith, who lives in Danville, Illinois. I've never met Benjamin I don't even know how he heard about us, but he's a great giver. We're so thankful for him. Um, he's been, you know, came on board recently. So thank you uh, so much, Benjamin. I'd love to meet you sometime, get to know you better. Catherine Paris is from Easton, PA. Catherine uh, has been with us for quite a while. I don't know exactly how long you might know Mindy, but um, Catherine, I haven't met you yet, I don't think, uh, but hopefully through Patreon, I'll get to know you a little better. I would love for you guys to write us notes. Uh, since we're such a small Patreon group, I am able to interact personally with all of you. So uh, do write me through Patreon if you have anything to say. So Sheila Breeden is also one of our donors. Um, she is from Oklahoma City. I've not met you yet, Sheila, but do communicate with us inside the portal. I'd love to get to know you better. Laura Preby, I can't believe she's actually a Patreon supporter, but I'm so thankful for her. She's been on our team for uh, since a super long time. I've lost track, uh, probably from 2019. She actually helped us uh, transcribe a bunch of interviews. She came to Normandy with us in 2019 and brought her family. She's uh, also held events in her own town. I love her creativity because she decided that she wanted to show the girl who wore freedom in her church and she figured out how to do a screening there. And she was just, she's been really, really helpful and thoughtful and encouraging. And we're so thankful that she's with us on Patreon still. Patricia here from the Villages, Florida. My guess is I met Patricia when I was at the Villages. Um, I don't remember you, unfortunately, but write me a note in Patreon and let's figure it out. Patricia Linkus, I just have to say it touches my heart so much that you are here and supporting me at $5 a month. Patricia used to clean my house when I had little babies. I kid you not, like my boys were three, five, something like that. And she, she knew I needed help and she came and cleaned for me and has been my friend ever since. So thank you so much, Patricia. Jody Black, also from the Villages. Um, I am wondering if I met you when I was down there. Thank you so much for uh, supporting us on Patreon. Daniel Grover, you too, in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we're super thankful. I don't know you either, but please write me a note. We'll get to know each other. Uh, the last one is Jill Fletchall, and this one is a crazy story. Uh, Jill has only been with us for a few weeks uh, because I met her in Gulf Shores, Alabama randomly, I was with Toma and Flavi down in Gulf Shores. And I went out to the beach one morning just to, you know, I don't know, see what was up. It was a cold, windy day. So there really wasn't anybody else on the beach, but this one family and this older woman walked up to me and said, do you want me to take a picture of you uh, on the beach? And I was like, oh no, I'm just taking a picture of the water. And we got to talking. She asked me why I was there. I told her a little bit about Tom and Flavi in the film. And she said, well, where can I watch it? I said, Apple TV. She said, honey, do we have Apple TV? And her daughter came and said, well, yeah, we have Apple TV. Why? And I explained again and turns out through a series of questions that her daughter just married one of my son's friends and is living in Wheaton, Illinois. <laughs> like, it's crazy how like that little connection happened. Uh, and then they invited us to breakfast the next morning. So they got to meet Tom and Flavi and hear all about Normandy. And um, they came to, to support us on Patreon. So Jill and her family, thank you very much for uh, supporting us here. And of course, Chuck Link, we talked about a couple of weeks ago. I've already given him a shout out, but I'm just going to say again, uh, we're so incredibly thankful for you. So uh, those are our Patreon supporters uh, that uh, are at a certain giving level. I think, is it everybody, Mindy? Tell us what the giving level is for being a shout out on the pod podcast. 
That is a great question, Christian. Let me pull that up here. Um, I'll also add the caveat that those are mostly uh, ones who we have not shouted out before. There are a few others who have been um, mentioned before. So um, not wanting to exclude anybody who's... Um, yeah, Erica Iverson, you're one of them. We, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> we've, yep. we've mentioned you before, but we're so thankful for you. So, okay. Um, shout outs on the Documentary First podcast begin at the, um, correct me if my pronunciation is wrong here, Christian, Turkville, the $5 yeah, the a Turkville month. level, okay. $5 a month. Okay. So $5 a month or more, you too can have your name shouted out here on the Documentary First podcast. Um, but really, I can't tell our supporters enough how grateful we are for them. Um, you know, definitely for the financial support, it's keeping us going at this point in time, but also, you know, just kind of the connection and the emotional support too, to know that there's somebody out there uh, paying attention <laughs> when we post yeah. things on Patreon, your comments, your likes, Christian and I both see them all and it means a lot um, and we have some very exciting um, material coming your way uh, so as Christian said before grueling glory is coming we promise um, there's just one other video we want to get out to you first and it's this uh, amazing jeep tour of Normandy with Tama and Flavi and Christian and I think Danny's in there too isn't she Flo is in there and my husband uh, Jeremy yeah we're oh, Flo, all kind of okay, on the yes. tour yeah. So, um, you know, as you all know, we're a team of volunteers, uh, mostly pulling this together. So sometimes it takes us a little longer than we plan to get stuff out the door. Um, but it is coming Jeep tour, I believe will be out this week. Um, if everything keeps going well, and then after that, uh, we will have grueling glory available for our Patreon supporters. So we're working on it folks. It is coming your way as soon as we can get it there. Yeah. I and I just want to, seen- grueling glory so whoa okay we got to get a link to jason oh, i never had that. an opportunity jason it's nine minutes and 23 seconds and i know no one I ever sent it to me oh, oh my goodness i guess i better send it to you mindy while we're talking do that today okay, um, we'll get to you <laughs> anyway the other thing i wanted to say to you patreon people is we really are about to embark on this exciting journey of new projects. Um, We've got the Carenton project, we've got the Brave Dutch project, and this group is so small. Uh, It is a group that I want, you know, to be on the ground floor with what's happening. I want to hear their ideas. I want them to be a part of what we're doing. So uh, if you are interested in that kind of journey and adventure, now is the time to join Patreon. So enough about that uh what are we here to talk about today jason well we're here to talk about uh what you look for in a cinematographer and so we thought who who better to uh to do that than an aspiring cinematographer slash patreon <laughs> person <laughs> <laughs> like you i wear a lot of hats <laughs> <laughs> for sure oh uh, yeah yeah so christian you and i were talking briefly um, about cinematography and you know i know both as a first time filmmaker and now as an experienced documentary filmmaker, you have seen a lot. You've had to figure out what you like and what you don't, what works and what doesn't. Um, so I'm really curious to know, um, let's start with where you are now and what you look for now. And I, I bet as we explore that, we're gonna be able to pull out some of the lessons you've learned along the way. But as a director with upcoming projects, what are you looking for in a cinematographer or director of photography um, as you're crewing out these next jobs? Yeah, great question. I really am um, looking for something different than I was looking for with the girl who wore freedom. At that point, I was just looking for anybody that would say yes. <laughs> So I didn't do a ton of vetting. I was trusting other people to do that. So now I am looking for a much more experienced cinematographer, uh, somebody that has um, developed a very strong point of view, someone that has good experience, has a very, very good eye in terms of light and color and um, framing, but somebody that can think almost with the head of an editor, honestly, Mm -hmm. because it's super important that they be able to see and visualize what this film will become one day. And really what I'm looking for in a cinematographer now, I think was shaped by the edit in The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Because, let's talk about that. Cause people, yeah. people tend to not think about this until they're in the edit suite. And mm-hmm. at that point, unless you have budget to go back and do pickups, you're in trouble. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there, were, before I get to that, what I learned in the edit, I want to talk about, well, I guess this did happen in the edit. I had done some directing previously. A lot of it was in stage theater. And when I think back to how I was operating as a director um, in the beginning of the Girl of War Freedom, I was wearing that kind of director hat, thinking more about the acting and, you know, the big picture of what I was seeing as I was doing a reenactment, for example. Um, And I didn't understand the crucial importance of a video monitor. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, I used to wonder when I was on set as an actor, why the directors always had their head in this box and were, you know, looking only in there. Well, I learned the hard way why that is, um, because on several different occasions, Bill Ebel and I were in the edit suite and I was saying, well, I know this person did that. I know where is that film? Let's find this film. I know she touched her chest. I know this person walked over there. I know the parachute fell on top of him like this. Let's find that. And Bill would come back to me and he goes, well, where is it Christian? I'm like, it's in the film. It has to be in there. He's like, it is not. This is all we have. It must be in your memory. And, and he was right. I was looking outside at everything that was happening around. And I, there were some times like at the Lafayette shoot where I didn't have a video monitor at all. So I was not seeing what the camera people were seeing. I only saw the event unfolding. And that was heartbreaking because what I saw on a bigger scale uh, was incredibly powerful and moving. Uh, But because I couldn't adjust it because I didn't have a monitor, I lost that moment. So I would certainly say, you know, that lesson of learning the importance of zoning in on the monitor and not leaving that monitor uh, critically important for sure. So that was one thing I learned in the edit. Another thing I learned in the edit was there were several occasions where I wanted to kill my cinematographers. (laughs) This I need to know about. (laughs) How to avoid being killed by your director. (laughs) A lot of it had to do with what I feel was the, the cinematographers not being in the moment. Mm. So they were there. You could see them filming. It looked visually okay, but they weren't really paying attention to the emotional dynamic dynamics that were happening. We have a whole group of like uh, postpartum uh, edits that we wanted to talk about at the end with our cinematographers. But um, the most grievous one for me was we had this moment between a veteran and a little boy. And the veteran, George Schinkel, is sitting in his wheelchair. The little boy, probably about 10, was standing next to him. And you could see the little boy just looking up at this veteran with this amazing love in his eyes. And then he looked away and the veteran noticed the little boy. And then you see the little boy turn his head and the camera's gone. Oh, wow. And we were like, that was the magical moment. But that cinematographer was not witnessing. And he really, at first was only zoomed in on those two people. Hmm. And, but he was not thinking about what was happening between those two people. Right. Um, so that happened a lot. There were a lot of moments like that, particularly in interviews where I just felt like the focus of the cinematographer was somewhere else. It wasn't on what the action was happening right mm-hmm. then. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really am looking for that maturity really in a cinematographer, not just how to frame things or how to make sure the light is right or uh but it's really more how do you tell the emotional heart of a story with all of those things combined and then how do you um you know do you know um you know how to create that story with what you're shooting right Um, so those are 
some super important things that I'm looking for. Yeah, no, those are all really good points. And, you know, from, from the uh, perspective of someone who's learning about all this, cinematography is a really interesting balance between having technical know-how and paying attention to all the technical details to make sure you capture correctly, you know, in the right codec, in the right frame rate, all of these things so that it's usable, <laughs> usable footage, but also having the emotional presence and intelligence to sit in the moments. Um, I think especially with non-scripted work, um, documentary style work, you know, knowing enough about what's going on around you to catch those moments and to sit with them, even if, you know, your mind's going, oh, I also got to go over here and get this and we need to make sure we get that too. So yeah, really important lessons for sure. Um, it is not lost on me that that is not an easy thing to do. That's kind of why I use the word mature mm -hmm. because, you know, a, you're there in a moment where you're probably thinking about, you know, at least 10 different super crucial pieces of information, mm -hmm. just like you just said. And yeah. so you have to have the ability to think about all of that basically at once and not panic. Mm -hmm. and be able to work with other people. So on bigger sets, you have assistant camera people, you have focus pullers, you have all these other people that you are the captain of the ship. And you have to be able to not only manage exactly what's going on in front of you, but also the people that are working with you. Right, Mindy? Yes. Yes, it's very true. Um, it's kind of funny. So I came up doing video where I was the one person who did everything usually called like one man band projects. Um, and I would look at the list of credits on movies and things. And, you know, you have the entire camera department often with multiple units and they all have like four to five people in them and just be like, wow. And part of me was like, but is that overkill? You know, <laughs> are they, are they just spending money? Cause they can at this point. But as I've um, started working my way up the ranks in the Nashville film scene, and I'm doing some assistant camera work on some larger projects, I'm beginning to see that now this is really a system that's been honed over many, many years and everybody has a job and what the purpose of having so many people are in place is, is to have um, people who are experts at each of the things that they do and also to ensure the perfection as much as possible as possible of every single element. And so, you know, you, Yes, camera people can pull their own focus. A lot of camera people do for their entire careers. However, you're risking your focus maybe being a little off because you were thinking about your framing in the moment or the emotion of the moment, not your focus. So when you have a focus puller on set, their job is to make sure that the focus is sharp no matter what's going on. Um, and so, you know, you're investing in the perfection of your focus by hiring that person to be on your crew. And so, um, you know, it's always this interesting balance between like how much can you spend? <laughs> how much budget do you have to ensure the perfection versus doing what you can with what you have and realizing that because there are so many elements in play, um, you know, your, your risk of something being a little off is higher, you know, if you're not filling all the roles, um, yeah. Even when our all the roles are filled, stuff can go wrong, and it does. But uh, it's been really interesting to kind of learn about how the chain of command works and how uh, management of a camera department works, and why all of those people are there. Yeah, and it's really a form of insurance <laughs> for sure. And I, I, I too, when I first started this, and I looked at all of the credits, I was like you know, it does not really take that many people <laughs> to do these things. And truthfully, it doesn't. I mean, you can make a project with very few crew, um, but you're right. You get to another level when you bring on people who focus on a very narrow band of things and they do it very, very well and, um, and get a lot of money for doing, for mastering that tiny little skill, you know? Yep. It's um, true because it all comes together and, you know, in the end of things, mm -hmm. um, I'll say another thing that I think is super important. What I'm looking for in a, in a DP or a cinematographer is I do want them to come with a point of view. Mm -hmm. So when they come to, um, to speak with me or to talk with me about a project that I want them to do, I do want them to be able to come to the table with something 
with creative ideas, creative vision. Um, and I, I'm hoping that they will, um, we will begin to form a collaborative, collaborative, you know, cooperative relationship where we begin to, um, build each on each other's ideas. Um, and, you know, I didn't necessarily, um, have that relationship before with, with Corey Lillard, our cinematographer, just because we were so new and mm -hmm. I didn't really know what I was doing. He had more experience than I did. That was also a, a different thing. I gave away a lot of my power early on in this project because I thought, I don't know anything. These people know more than I do. And one of the big lessons for me was I know more than I thought I did. And I had a stronger point of view than I thought I did. And I needed to assert that. And then I needed to say what I was interested in and what I wanted people to do and provide a vision that charted a course. Um, and I do think that part of some of our difficulties uh, were that I didn't lead that way. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't lead that way. And I, mm -hmm. I gave away too much of the choices or the decisions or the powers. So another thing I'm looking for is someone that will follow some that will give me their ideas. This is what I see. This is what I think we can do. What do you think about this idea? But if in the end, if I say, no, we're going to go this way, uh, then I want him or her to be able to say, all right, I'm on board with you. Let's go. Um, another thing I'm looking is someone who can be a good leader of their team. So even if you're just going to take camera and sound, you've still got two people there that are going to be working together. And I would see the, the cinematographer or the DP as the head of that team. So, so there you go. Those are just a few small things that I'm looking for up front. Yeah, no, I think those are really great. And since we have several first time filmmakers uh, who are listening to this, I'm really curious what you'd say to them as they're trying to weigh out like budget constraints, you know, project desires, um, and, you know, figuring out their own leadership and their own voice in that. Because um, I think like I know for me, when I was starting out, I'd hear people say, well, I want someone who has a creative voice or I want someone with a perspective. Um, and that feels really nebulous when you're starting out. So for the first time filmmakers out there who are looking at all of this, and maybe it feels a little overwhelming, um, what would you say both to directors and to um, aspiring cinematographers about finding that perspective and that voice in your leadership style? Well, it's interesting, Mindy, because I think we have a, a good case study here. I was thinking about this as you were speaking. You have wanted to grow as a cinematographer and really uh, grow up in this industry and learn each one of those little disciplines um, so that you felt confident in your skills and you could say, yes, I can be a DP. Mm -hmm. And um, so part of your time here with us is hopefully developing those skills, beginning to put together a reel, stuff like that. Um, I'm very committed to making that happen because I believed in you when I first got to know you, I had a sense over the course of the time that you've been helping us on this team, you've come on board and you've said, you know, I can help with this. I think I can help with that. Um, but another thing that you did is you showed me you had boundaries I have a little bit of margin here. This is what I'm very good at here. I have this time available over here. So what I learned about you was that you were able to manage your own life. You were able to keep yourself healthy. You are, you come with a very strong point of view, but you are able to follow. If I say, we're going to go in this direction and you aren't offended by that. In fact, you jump on board and say, let's go. Um, so those qualities for me, getting to know you over time, I will take you on a shoot with me in a heartbeat. I've seen you have creative gifts and abilities. I've seen, you know, you work in a team setting uh, and I've seen you chart strong leadership, even with me when I've asked you, what do you think about this? So developing that relationship, I think with a director over time is a good start. Um, because I think also another critical component between a director and a DP is that relationship. There has to be that, that trust there and knowing each other, meeting somebody and just seeing their real, I don't think is enough 
to to go on a two week shoot with or whatever. No, it's not. Interestingly, um, so there's a documentary DP who's done some mentoring with me and she tells me she doesn't look at people's reels. If she's trying to get some help on a project or um, there's a project she can't take and she's going to make a recommendation for someone else, she asks for dailies. She asks for the raw footage. She said there's way too much you can cover up with editing in a reel. She doesn't care what you can cobble together of your best of. She wants to see what you've done in an entire day and she wants to see it raw and untouched, which was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's been doing this a long time and she's uh, seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of a lot of it. So yeah. Well, so Mindy, now that we have you here, tell me what you have learned. And I mean, I know you don't see yourself as a, you know, this advanced cinematographer, but you have learned a lot along the way. If you were talking to young filmmakers, what are cinematographer, you know, people that are aspiring to do that job, what would your advice be? Oh man. Yeah. There's so much to learn. And honestly, I expect I'll be learning for as long as I do this. Um, you know, there's, there's people who have been doing this their entire career who are still learning. And that's one of the things I love about it is there's always something new to learn, always something new to try. And honestly, if you get to the point where you're not trying something new, I've heard from several people much further down the road than I am, that that's the point that your career kind of dies because you're not being creative anymore. Um, And so, um, you know, there's so many great technical resources out there now. Um, I think that's a a little bit of an unexpected gift through the whole last two years is people have taken a lot of what used to happen in person in LA and New York, and they've made available online. So for someone like me who lives in a smaller market like Nashville, um, been able to attend a lot of great um, webinar type events to learn from people. Um, I got to attend an ASC masterclass on documentary cinematography, and it's pretty crazy who all was in the room. I mean, one guy was like, yeah, back when I was filming with Bruce Lee, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> and yeah, there was another cinematographer who's like the go-to guy for IMAX movies about space. And someone was like, can you tell us how gimbals work in space <laughs> and stuff like that? And this was just on the breaks this wasn't even what was being taught um and so like the level of education you can get uh just with a good internet connection has really improved in the last several years and um so that's amazing i'd say take full advantage of that um there are so many aspects you're paying attention to you know the the human connection the emotion in the scene all the millions of technical details that there are um you know, lighting, framing, composition, um, camera systems, all of that. Um, I think, you know, speaking to myself, uh, as I started out on this journey, you know, I'd say, don't get too overwhelmed by the technical options, because there are thousands of them, and they're always changing. Um, And, you know, chances are, you're not going to master all of them. And I think what I've learned is, um, even at the highest level, those cinematographers aren't a technical master of everything, um, but they know how to hire people who are for the needs that they have. And um, they know how to find answers when they need them. So um, in fact, in this masterclass, um, Shauna Hagen, who was teaching it, kept saying, you know, don't focus too much on the technical, the soft human skills are really the ones that you need to master, particularly for documentary work. Um, Said, you know, you can always get help with the technical, you can always find information on the technical, but what makes a great film is that emotional connection, uh, Christian, that you were talking about. And so, um, yeah, and then something that's been told to me that I will pass on is, uh, you know, if you want to shoot, get out there and shoot. So, you know, find opportunities to uh, shoot for yourself or shoot for your friends or, um, you know, shoot for a nonprofit in your area, you know, whether you're making any money or not, you know, it's a chance to practice skills that you really have to take from head knowledge into practical skill. Um, And so that's something I'm working on is, is, making the most of those opportunities to, to get out there and practice everything that I'm learning. I, that, that made me think of um, one of my favorite sayings is a writer who doesn't write isn't a writer. And so a cinematographer who doesn't cinematograph, not a cinematographer, <laughs> that's get out there and shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
That's what Ken Burns, that what those were his words to me in my master class. Just do it. You're, you can learn in class, but you're not going to really learn how to make a film till you make a film. So uh, wise, wise words. And your advice to don't be afraid of, you know, the technical stuff, like don't feel like you have to have all of that mastered is so wise. I remember Vincent Shade said to me, my biggest reluctance at taking on the director piece of this or really doing this film was that I didn't know any of the technical stuff. I didn't know about the cameras. I knew microphones and sound and stuff like that because I'm a voiceover actor. But even there, I'm a little, I'm limited um, because camera stuff and sound stuff is changing continuously. Uh, and I felt like I needed to master those things in order to be a director. And, and the fact is there are some directors that know all of that and they know what cameras do and, um, and I don't, uh, but that doesn't mean I can't direct either. So I just say, you know, don't be afraid of what you don't know. You're right. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. go out there and learn it and figure it out. Yeah. So. I think you need to be aware of what you don't know, which you are, um, so that you can fill in those gaps. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid of it for sure. And then, you know, build your team in such a way that those gaps are filled in. Yeah. You know? Right. Um, usually that requires budget. So, you know, for the first timers mm -hmm. out there listening to this going, yeah, that sure would be nice, but you know, I can't afford a five person camera team. Um, just know that, know your limitations in that. Um, and as much as possible, make them work for you. You know, realize you're not going to look like, um, Spielberg here, you know, on your first stab, but, um, you know, there's, there's something to the raw authenticity of, um, someone's work when they're still figuring things out. And that can be an advantage. Um, you just need to be aware of it and, and leverage it in such a way that it uh, works with your story and not against your story. Yeah. One other thing I think that you do well, Mindy, is I also, you've talked a lot about putting yourself under mentors. Uh, you've, you've even done that here with the girl who were freedom, but you've also done that with specific, uh, cinematographer people. And I think that's a great model for others, you know, really seek out others who can teach you, show you, um, you know, apprentice learning in, in my mind is some of the best that there is. So, um, kudos to you for doing that. And I definitely think that, um, others should take your lead. Well, uh, fortunately, um, most cinematographers are when they have time, very interested in talking about what they do and, um, a lot of people at high levels have come up through an apprenticeship program. So when they have time and mental space, um, it's, they're amazing people to ask questions to. And I've received some really generous um, answers and really generous help through that process. Um, I will just say like, know your moment, <laughs> especially if you're on set with somebody, you know, when they're discussing the shot with the director is not the time to ask your career questions. Um, but, you know, if there's a quiet moment at crafty or at lunch, or, you know, uh, if they happen to ask you what you're interested in doing, um, those moments often happen. And it's, it's a great chance to learn from someone who's invested a lot of time and uh, expertise into a really amazing craft. Do you think it would be okay to, to seek them out and, and write them an email? I do. Um, emails, Instagram, direct messages. Uh, there's a very active DP community on Instagram. Um, I've experienced, particularly in the documentary world, um, they're not quite as busy and they don't get quite as many inquiries as the people who do the giant narrative stuff. And so, um, you know, again, know your moment and don't be pushy, but, um, I mean, Christian, that's how you and I connected. So I reached out to you on Instagram. So, um, and I think I've, I've heard several other people say that they're very open to that. Um, but I'd say, you know, if, if you don't hear back, um, you know, don't be offended and, and don't get pushy about it. Cause often, especially if they're working at a high level, these people are very, very busy. Um, you know, 12 hours, 12 hour days on set travel, all of that, um, takes a toll, but, um, I think by and large when they have time and mental space, uh, it's a group of people who are very interested in passing on what they know. Awesome. Do you think, speaking of passing on what, you know, you could give us some resources that we could put in our show notes, be they, um, you know, websites or a podcasts or whatever you've got that we could, uh, share with people 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, Roger Deakins is a very well-known, um, in fact, he's Sir Roger Deakins now, um, very well-known cinematographer. He has a podcast where he interviews both other cinematographers and directors, um, and those conversations are really fascinating, and you're getting to hear people at a very high level talk about their craft and how they got there and what they would have done differently and, and all that stuff. Um, the Wandering DP is another podcast where um, a commercial DP in Australia interviews uh, other DPs from around the world who do uh, great work. And I found that listening to other DPs discussing light in particular and discussing what they've learned through their um, experience is extremely valuable to me. Um, and then there's an online learning platform called Filmmakers Academy, and it's um, produced by Shane Hurlbut, ASC, and his wife. Um, and Shane's been a DP uh, for many, many years out in LA, does a lot of large narrative work, but um, he's also a really good teacher, and he teaches lighting, he teaches composition, he teaches... Um, filters and lenses and all these things. And he's also starting to pull together other people who are experts in their craft. So his first AC teaches some classes. One of the colorists he works with teaches some classes. Um, he's got an unscripted filmmaker um, DP who's teaching some classes. So it's a really great uh, resource. And the videos are often kind of bite-sized like between five and 15 minutes. So I have a goal of watching one a day um, to learn something new and um, he films his camera tests too. So he'll set up uh, four of the same camera with four different lenses, but film the exact same thing. And it's stuff that I would love to do, but I can't afford to do it right now. <laughs> and so getting to watch him film that test and he talks through what he sees um, and he describes the light and the shadow and the contrast and the bokeh and all of this. And I feel like I'm getting kind of secondhand experience for stuff that um, would have taken me a lot more time and a lot more money to do myself. So um, that's been really, really helpful to me as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing those. We really appreciate that. Yeah. Hope it helps somebody else. I'm sure it will. All right. Well, um, we're, we're almost out of time. So we have to transition into uh, DocuView Deja Vu uh, real quick. Um, so um, I actually, I did come up with a documentary, Christian. So you, you don't have to be mad at me this week. <laughs> ah, excellent. Well, we have to get this right, though, Jason. You have to be like, and now it's time for our new segment. DocuView Deja, Deja Vu. DocuView Deja Vu. Then we have to give space in order for the music to play that Jeff wrote. That's amazing. Uh, so eventually we'll get the segment, right? Oh, you Maybe. came up with something. That's awesome. You start then. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember if we've ever talked about this before. This is a documentary from 2011. It's one of my all-time favorite documentaries. Uh, it's Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Oh, that's such a good one. Yeah. What is so it? good. <laughs> Jiro Dreams of Sushi. It's about G -I -R -O? a five. G-I-R-O. Okay. Uh, it's about a five-star Michelin rated uh, sushi restaurant in Japan. The entire thing is in Japanese. It's subtitled. Uh, and it's about this family that makes sushi. And it, it is so incredibly um, precise. <laughs> I mean, I could watch macro shots of knives going through fish all day long. Um, and that, that's just jam-packed full of them. Um, it is a really interesting story about a father who is insanely uh, particular about how he does things. And like his, his son has been his apprentice for like 30 years and still isn't good enough. Yeah. And his other son, uh, I think the eldest son uh, left because he's left-handed. And so he started, a, he made a mirrored restaurant that is exactly 100% mirrored down to like the exact inches uh, so that he can make sushi because his dad wouldn't let a left-handed person it's just it is fascinating and brilliant and mindy i would love to hear what you think about it because you've seen it yeah i love it too um the family dynamics are fascinating um culturally it's an insight into a culture i know almost nothing about both sushi sushi culture and you know japanese culture um I'm always fascinated by someone who's an expert at what they do. And, you know, the master sushi chef definitely is. Um, that level of commitment to detail and excellence is, um, it's just amazing to watch. Um, 
but yeah, there's a lot of threads in play. I feel like it's a really complex layered story and I appreciate that. Yet the filmmakers took somewhat of a minimalist approach to it, uh, both visually, which I feel like suits the subject. So um, it's, it's one I could watch over and over again as well. And I feel like I get something different out of it every time I see it. Even yeah, if I don't absolutely. like sushi, would I like this? Oh yeah. When, when I first watched it, I had never had sushi. So did yeah. you have sushi it, since? It, yeah. Oh, I don't like sushi. It didn't turn me off to sushi. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't have to like sushi. Now, if you can't look at raw fish, that's another thing. Okay. But <laughs> I can handle that. I can it's, handle that. One yeah. little thing I want to say is that he was 80 when they made the documentary initially in, in 2011. Like he was in his 80s. He's now 94 and still going. <laughs> <laughs> wow that's impressive so, yeah you mean the father or the son the father he's still going yeah wow yeah. that's that's incredible okay so now i i mean i do love stories so i should like that one yeah. um, okay, Mandy, yeah. you said you had one today yeah so i watched one last night that really drew me in um it's called born to play and it's on hulu uh and it is a story about a women's tackle football semi-pro team. Um, I did not know that this was a thing. So I was introduced to the world of semi-pro women's tackle football. And uh, you get to follow this team through their, I believe it was their 2018 season. Um, and they're kind of on the road to redemption from having lost the playoffs the day before. But um really beautifully shot. I really appreciated the cinematography of it. Um, you know, I think with sports docs, there can be a tendency to move really quickly. And I felt like they moved at the pace of the story they were telling. And I really appreciated that. Uh, plus the color and the lighting and a lot of what they're doing because they were working with available light in a lot of it. And that is an art form in and of itself. Um, and you really get to know several of the players. And it was just fascinating to me to jump into these stories of these women who are between ages, I think like 20 and some of them are into their mid to upper forties, still playing wow. tackle football. And to me, to love something that causes you pain on a regular basis that much um, that you're committing because um, they have to pay to play. They're not, you know, they're not like NFL players who get paid to play. Um, they're having to invest their own time and money into this and um, they're super passionate about it. And I just really loved getting immersed in that world for, you know, I think it's like an hour and a half last night. Wow, that sounds great. It reminds me of um, the film that won Best Documentary at the Flathead Lake International Cinema Fest. I may have mentioned this before, but it was called Open Field, and it had a lot of the same, you know, elements there. It did follow one the quarterback of this one particular team, and um, you know, it was not, in my opinion, well shot or well edited, um, and there were lots of issues with the film, but it did have that emotional heart and storyline telling sort of a similar story that you're telling. I don't think it's gotten distribution yet, but, but we'll see. Apparently, uh, apparently this is in right now. So maybe they'll, maybe they'll have a good shot. Well, mine, I also watched last night as well. Actually, I've watched it over a couple of nights and it's not a documentary. It's a documentary series. And it is only for those people who like murder mysteries or mysteries. So uh, if you're, I did, I'm not one of those people. I did not think that I liked those kind of shows, but my husband um, told me one night we were going to watch a crime documentary. And I was like, Mm, no, that's not for me. I'm not interested. And it was one about Ted Bundy. And I like, oh gosh, <laughs> so I got no. sucked in. it was terrible. And I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that I was interested in it anyway. So now he makes me watch these things sometimes and I do get sucked in. And one of them was this one that I've watched over the last couple of nights called worst roommate ever on Netflix. I don't know if it's come up or if you guys have seen it, uh, but it is a series. And right now I think there are one, two, three, five in the series and it is mind blowing that what happens in this documentary series actually happens. Um, and I actually have learned a lot from this about what to do or not to do in several different, uh, scenarios. And I have to say, I was guilty of several things that people did to get these really bad roommates. And I like have 
thanked my lucky stars that <laughs> really thanked God that he has spared me uh, some crazy tales. So worst roommate ever on Netflix. If you watch it, please leave a message uh, in our somewhere on Twitter. You can leave us messages. You can leave us messages on the documentary first Facebook page, Twitter page, Instagram page, or you can join Patreon and leave us a message there. That would work too. <laughs> All right. So Jiro dreams of sushi born to play and worst roommate ever are our recommendations for this week. We've kind of, we've kind of run the gamut on uh, types of docs there. So <laughs> there should be something for everyone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> for sure. Well, all right, I guess we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.